Hi folks, welcome to the muscle tissue chapter. This is one of my favorite chapters. And it's a difficult chapter because what happens is between the muscular system and the nervous system, you uh, whatever one comes first, you have to learn the depolarization of a membrane and the propagation of an action potential. So if you do the muscle system first, you have to learn that. <clears throat> and typically that topic is actually in the nervous system. So what do we do? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat the depolarization of a membrane and an action potential very ephemerally in this chapter. I'm just going to do an overview of it and then realize that when you get to AMP, Anatomy and Physiology 2, you'll do the nitty-gritty details of membrane depolarization and propagation of action potentials. For this chapter, we'll just say, say things like the nerve fires, the muscle fires. We'll just say it like that, and the mystery of that will come to get you later. All right, here's six functions of skeletal muscle tissue. Some of these are probably intuitive. Uh, exactly, I mean, right there, that's intuitive. What do muscles do? They move your bones around. Uh, this is probably intuitive. They main your, maintain your, body, your posture and body position. Uh, they do support soft tissues. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sphincter muscles, circular muscles that open and close and guard entrances. That's actually right there, but that's supporting some of the soft tissues. There are smooth muscles wrapped around a lot of your tubes in your body, like your blood vessels and your digestive tract. So uh, s these smooth muscles are supporting those. They also maintain body temperature. That's shivering. And they store nutrient reserves. Uh, muscles store glycogen and uh, fats. So that's the six functions of skeletal muscle tissue right there. The architecture of a muscle. You gotta know this, and you'll know you'll learn it in lab and in lecture. So every named muscle is an organ. So you see this biceps brachii right there? That's an organ. So this deltoid muscle, that's an organ. See this triceps brachii right there? That's an organ. So every named muscle is an organ. And remember what an organ is. And remember we had atoms, basic unit of matter. We had two or more atoms made molecules. We had the four biological macromolecules, and I'm not going to repeat them for you right now, but you remember your four biological macromolecules. You had organelles, subcellular structures, like mitochondria and rough ER and Golgi. Then you had the basic unit of life, which is the cell. Well, two or more cells came together to form tissues, and then two or more tissues came together to form organs. So every named muscle is an organ. Now, an organ better have more than two tissues in it. So as I do this architecture of a muscle, make sure there's more than two tissues in it. Well, here we go. First of all, we have an epimesium. Right there is the epimesium. That's connective tissue. And that's a connective tissue wrapping of the entire organ. Now, within that epimesium, we have these fascicles. Like, that's a fascicle, and that's a fascicle. And what we do here is you can see we've t down here we've pulled a fascicle out of the muscle. So you can see all these fascicles in here. And you pull one out so you can look at it a little better. That makes this whole thing a fascicle. Now what's surrounding this fascicle? A paramecium. So an epimesium surrounds the entire organ and a paramecium surrounds a fascicle. Well what's inside the fascicle? What's inside the fascicle are a bunch of cells. So this is a cell, and that is a cell. And what we've done is, inside this fascicle right here, we've pulled out one cell. Now, as it turns out, in a muscle tissue, a cell is called myofiber. That's what it's called. So this is a, this is a myofiber, a muscle cell. And there is connective tissue surrounding the cell, and that is called endomesium. That word right there, endomesium. So in the architecture of a muscle, you have to know the epimesium, the paramecium, and the endomesium. By the way, some people pronounce that epimysium, paramysium, and endomysium, and that's, of course, fine. So that's the architecture of a muscle, of a muscle organ, of a f muscle fascicle, of a myofiber. You have the epimesium, paramecium, and endomesium. So you definitely have more than two tissues here. You have connective tissue setting up the architecture. And then you have muscular tissue, which is all this proteins in here. 
that you see in here. So you have uh, you have blood vessels inside your your organ. See these blood vessels, arteries and veins, arteries and veins, nerves. You have nervous tissue in there. So certainly a muscle is an organ. There's lots of tissues inside of it. This is showing you that embryonically what happens is we have these myoblasts that fuse together to make an immature myofiber. And this actually explains why myofibers are multinucleated. Because if I'm going to fuse three cells together here, and actually there's more because I can see more nuclei, but if I'm going to fuse these cells together here, well now I'm going to have one multinucleated myofiber. And that's how we embryonically start to form our muscle cells from these fusion of myoblasts. Uh, ultimately, what we get are, uh, are long, well, i got to be careful because I'm not only talking about skeletal muscle right now. There's actually three types of muscles, just so you know. There's skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Okay, so those are three types of muscles. Right here, we're looking at a picture of skeletal muscle. So a skeletal muscle is a very long cell, and it says up to 30 centimeters in length. That's pretty long. The, the myofiber runs, a, a given myofiber runs the entire length of a muscle organ. So in your biceps brachii, it runs, the myofibers run from one end to the other end. But there's millions of those myofibers running from one end to the other end. And you're going to say, well, how are they lined up? Just like we already talked about. Just like this. See, this myofiber right here runs the entire length of this muscle. And the myofiber next to it runs the entire length. And that one runs the entire length. And the fascicles run the entire length. So a muscle organ has all of these myofibers, myo myofibers running the entire length of it. And, of course, its contraction is its job, so it's going to contract. And we'll talk about how it does that. Let's look at the ultrastructure of the cell. So now we're looking inside the cell. Okay, so before we were saying epimesium surrounds the organ and paramesium surrounds the fascicle and endomesium surrounds the cell. Well, now we're going through the phospholipid bilayer right here and into the cell, inside the cell. You can see mitochondria here. The main thing packed that's filling this cell, however, is the contractile proteins. That's the main pro. That's the that's mainly what's filling up this cell. Inside the myofiber, a muscle fiber is called a myofiber. Inside the myofiber, I have myofibrils. All right. Now these myofibrils come in two flavors. They come in thick filaments. No, I shouldn't say it like that. These myofibrils are made up of myofilaments. So myofibrils have myofilaments in them. I'll draw it over here. Myofibrils have myofilaments. And the myofilaments come in two flavors. I have thick and thin myofilaments. The thick ones are mainly myosin molecules, myosin proteins, and the thin myofilaments are actually composed of three different types of thin filaments, actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. And we're going to look in details about those, so don't try to replay this too much to get it. You'll get it. It's coming up. All right, so a myofiber is packed full of myofibrils. You can see each one of these maroon colored circles is a myofibril. The myofibrils, pull one out. We just pulled a myofibril out right there. Pull a myofibril out and look at it. And what is it composed of? Myofilaments. Two main classes of myofilaments are thick and thin filaments. And those are composed of specific proteins we're going to look at. Notice that I have a, a lot of smooth ER inside a myofiber. And the smooth ER in the muscle is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's really smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We just call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. We have a triad inside a muscle, and it's the dilated end of one smooth sarcoplasmic reticulum, a T-tubule, and a dilated end of the other smooth ER or sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this area right here is called a triad. These dilated terminals of the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, are called terminal cisternae 
because they are dilated and make a cistern. Very, very important right in here. Signaling for contraction is going to involve this triad right here. Otherwise, the SER really stores a lot of calcium. That's what the SR does for us. Now, muscles have invaginations in them. Myofibers, I should say. I shouldn't say muscles because you might think I'm thinking of the organ. I'm talking about the cell, the myofiber. Myofibers have invaginations in the plasma membrane. This little invagination here and this little invagination here, it's kind of like taking your fingers uh, and, and forcing them into, say, a half-filled balloon. And then when you take your fingers out, the indentations stay. So what happens is these transverse tubules, when you're inside this tubule, you're not inside the cell. You're still outside the cell. But you're inside a tubule that was made by pressing into the plasma membrane and pressing that into the cell, if that makes sense. You wouldn't be inside the cell until you left this tubule, whoops, until you left this tubule and got right into there, into the cytoplasm. So these transverse tubules are invaginations. And what they allow for is for signals that are out here to somehow get deep into the cell. Because if that signal out here crossed the plasma membrane right here, it's got to flow up and around this and flow through the cytoplasm, and the cytoplasm is packed full of proteins, and it's got to flow over here. And see, it's got a long ways to go to get to the center. But if that signal could shoot down one of these tubules and then cross the tubule into the inside of the cell, it's a lot quicker. So we'll talk about these signals that use the T-tubules. All right, that's about it for that. Oh, sarcomeres, title of the slide. The functional unit of a myofiber, and therefore the functional unit of a muscle, is called a sarcomere, this word right here. These myofibrils that you see here have a repeating pattern of thick and thin filaments. You can see the thin filaments right here. You can see the thick filaments right here. You can see more thin filaments right here. And as it turns out, there's two lines or disks in the thin filaments. And that's a Z-disk right there and right there. In the, the space between two Z-disks, the myofilaments that make up the Z-disk are what we call a sarcomere. This is a sarcomere. And really what a muscle organ is, really what it is, is just repeated sarcomeres end to end to end to end any of them side by side absolutely because there are myofibrils side by side and there are fast my and there are myofibers so there are myofibrils side by side within the myofiber there are myo, myofibers side by side within the fascicle there are fascicles side by side within the organ but if you ignored that architecture what a muscle organ really is, is just a whole bunch of these sarcomeres lined up end to end to end to end. That's what it is. All right, so that's a sarcomere. Z-disc to Z-disc. This is another picture of the sarcomere. You can see the Z-disc right here, and you can see the Z-disc right here. Notice we call it a Z-line in our book. Some people call it a Z-disc. Some people call it a Z-line. And this area from here to here is called the sarcomere. That's a sarcomere. Now let's look at what the repeating pattern of myofilaments does for us. Well, the repeating pattern of myofilaments uh, is composed of these thin filaments and thick filaments. And the area that's mainly thin filaments right here allows light to go through. Because it's thin filaments and light can go through it, we call it the I-band. And that stands for isotropic. Light can travel through it, it appears lighter, and it's the isotropic or I-band. But then there's an area where is either overlap, thick and thin, thick and thin, thick and thin. So there's either overlap of thick and thin, or it's just thick. But either way, either way, if you have thick or overlap of thick and thin, you're going to have a band that doesn't allow light through and therefore appears dark. 
and that's called anisotropic, and that's called the A-band. Now, within the A-band, I'm going to erase that circle a little bit because I got you got to see the the uh, H-band and M-line. Within the A-band, you do have an area in the center that's slightly lighter. Why would that be? Because it's not an area of overlap of thick and thin filaments. It's still darker than the I-band, but since it's not an area of overlap, it's just the thick filaments, we call it the H-band. And it's just a slightly lighter area within the A-band. And then even more, even more architecture is within the H-band is this M-line. There's an M-line right here. And what's going to happen is these thick filaments are actually made of myosin. And the myosins are anchored to this M-line. And they are uh, constructed moving each direction out from the M-line. So, yes, and there's a protein that the M-line's made of, and we'll talk about it. And oh, it's a couple of different proteins, really. Um, we'll talk about nebulin and a couple other proteins in here. So that's the... Uh, that's the A-band, H-band, and M-line. Now, another protein in here, mainly seen with the thin filaments, and it's called Titan. It's called Titan because it's a very large protein. What it does is it anchors the... It doesn't anchor. That's a wrong word. It connects the thick filaments right here to the Z-line. And you, they're drawn as a wave on purpose because they prevent overstretching of the muscle. Now, if you take the entire organ or a fascicle or anything like that and you start stretching it, what's going to happen is these titan molecules are going to pull tight, taut. They're going to pull taut. And uh, they'll, they'll help to prevent overstretching of the muscle. All right, so that's the repeating patterns of the myofibers. And the myofibrils within the myofibers, and the repeating pattern is due to the repeating myofilaments within the myofibrils of the myofibers. And I hope you're starting to get that architecture down because it's pretty important. Now, this is a really, this is a pretty cool slide right here. Let me show you what they've done. They've cut this myofibril in different spots. Like they've cut it right here, and that's and follow the arrow that's this picture and then they cut it right here and that's this picture and then they cut it you can see you can see what's going on here they're cutting it in different spots now only one of these is super important to me and that's this one right here that's that one however I'm going to talk to all of these what would happen if I cut my myofibril right down through my Z line well what I would see is because the Titan molecules run from the myosin to the z-line what i see is a hexagon of actin that's the thin filaments these orange things are actin all right i see a hexagon of actin around a titan these green ones are titan all right are they labeled yeah they are right there there's titan are they actin labeled no wow actin And what is there anything that connects? I know why they didn't call it actin. They call it thin filament. Here's why. Really, a thin filament is composed of three proteins. It's actin, troponin, and tropomyosin. That's really what it's composed of. So they're labeling these orange uh, circles thin filaments, and that's perfectly fine. They're actually accurate doing that. So what you see at the Z-disc is you see all these thin filaments making a hexagon, hexagon around the titans. Well, the titans are actually ending right there. Well, they better be hooked to something, or they're not very good at preventing overstretching of the muscle. And the answer is they are hooked. These actinin actinin molecules right here and here and here these actinin molecules here are holding the titan to the thin filaments and they make this mesh work and it's right at the z-disc 
the Z disc is a mesh, mesh work of all those proteins. And then if I just cut through the I band, uh, but not on the Z line, this is what I see. I see my hexagon of thin filaments, and I see my Titan, but I don't see the actinin because this is not an area where the Titan is connected to the thin filaments. This is where the Titan has slack or looseness that could be pulled taut if your muscle stretches. Then, right here, I'm cutting through the H-band, and more specifically, I'm cutting right through the M-line of the H-band, and this is what I see. Similar to the Z-line, this M-line of the H-band has interconnected myosin molecules. So my myosin molecules are all interconnected right here, and nebulin's one of the proteins that does that. Oh, there's some other ones. We're not going to go into all the proteins. But here's where my myosin molecules are connected right at the M line. And then if I cut in the middle of the A band, but not on the, not within the H band and not on the M line, and I'm not cutting where there's a overlap either, this is what I see right there. Now, what are these, uh, what are these green things? Well, they happen to be Titan. See what Titan does, let me go back. I'm going to go back and I'll come back to this. What Titan does is it actually runs right up to the myosin, and the myosin monomers will actually coil around the Titan. So the Titan is actually in the middle of some of that myosin a little bit. Well, if that's true, then when I cut through Titan, I ought, when I cut through my A band, I ought to see the Titan in there. Well, you do. You see the green dots right there. And then lastly, what if I cut in an area of overlap? Now this is the important one. Because this is where contraction occurs. Contraction is because actin and myosin are overlapped. Let me put it another way. Contraction is because thin and thick filaments are overlapped. Now here's the cool thing. We're going to be looking at contraction from a two-dimensional uh, longitudinal cut of my muscle. But I want you to remember this cross-section of a muscle when we're doing contraction, and I'll help to remind you. Each thick filament, the purple thick filaments, each one of them, is surrounded by six thin filaments. It makes a hexagon around them. So you can see the hexagon around each thick filament. So when I tell you that the myosin heads off of the thick filaments reach up and grab the thin filaments and pivot, the myosin heads are grabbing every direction like that, not just the two dimensionals that you're going to see. They're going to reach up and grab all around them and grab six different actins. So these myosins are going to grab six different actins, and this is where contraction is going to occur. All right, this is a this is a recap of the architecture of a muscle organ, a muscle fascicle, a myofiber, a myofibril, and the myofilaments in the repeating pattern of I bands and A bands in a sarcomere. So there you go, that's a recap. All right, let's go even smaller. What happens if I look what happens if I look smaller? Well, this is a thin filament right here. This this right here is a thin filament. And at first glance, it's mo mostly made of actin. That orange stuff is called actin. But if you look closer, it has this turquoise or green tropomyosin. That's what it has, this turquoise or green tropomyosin. And in addition, it has these trimers of troponin. And it's a heterotrimer, meaning the three proteins here are different proteins. Troponin's a heterotrimer. And they also help to make up the thin filament. And my, my actin comes in these globules. This is a globular actin, or G-actin. And what I do is I line up all of this globular actin, and it makes a helix around a protein called nebulin. I line up all this globular actin helically around nebulin and I get a strand of actin and that's called F actin and F stands for fibrous so all the F actin is is a long fiber of G actins 
and they make a helix around the nebulon. And they're associated with tropomyosin, the turquoise, the green or turquoise, whatever you call that color, and they're made of these heterotrimers called troponin. That's a thin filament. Okay. Here you go, a thin filament. Here's a thick filament. Now, a thick filament is made up of myosin molecules, but there's probably 300. There's about 300 my myosin molecules this side of the M line, and there's 300 myosin molecules that side of the M line. And uh, they have globular heads on them. You can see the globular heads. Each myosin molecule, and there's 300 of them in each myofilament. So there's 300 in this one, there's 300 in this one, there's 300 in this one. See, there's lots of myosin in here. Each myosin molecule looks like a golf club. And here it is. You got this tail right here. You have a hinge, and it actually can hinge. And then you have the globular head. And you can see the dotted line here because the myosin head actually does grab and swivel, release, grab, swivel, release, grab, swivel, release. So this golf club shaped protein has a hinged neck and it actually does hinge. Now what happens is, you can see the globular heads on the myosin right here. These myosin heads reach up and grab an actin and then swivel. They swivel towards the M line. These myosin heads reach up, reach up and grab an actin and then swivel, and they swivel towards the M line. So the myofilaments themselves don't shorten. They slide past one another. But the sarcomere shortens because if these thin filaments right here are sliding towards the center, well, the thin filaments aren't getting any shorter. They're sliding. And these thin filaments right here are sliding towards the center. Those thin filaments aren't getting any shorter. They're sliding. But the sarcomere is getting shorter because the Z lines are being pulled towards the center. And this is how contraction works. This is a myofibril at rest. And this is a contracted myofibril. And you might be seeing what, other than this, the length of the, Z, the sarcomere, that's one big thing. But you might be seeing what else you can tell happens during contraction. My H band disappears. This is an area of no overlap between my, my uh, thick filaments. Well, there's no overlap between thick and thin filaments. It's an area of no overlap. It's only composed of thick filaments. It's called my H band of my A band. And what happens is these thin filaments slide into that area. So it becomes an area of overlap. And now look at my H band over here. It's pretty thin compared to over here. So really with a contracted sarcomere, what happens is my H bands start to disappear. They start to get thinner. And that's how contraction works in a nutshell. We're going to do the details. Okay, details to follow.